Father in heaven, we thank you because this evening, I believe you want to speak to us. You want us to know Jesus better. And so I pray that as we study your word, as we look through history, as we see really what happened in Rome, I pray that you will give us hope for our own lives. Bless us this evening, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are going to Rome, the Pax Romana. Did anyone know what the Pax Romana was? The Pax Romana was a document or a, a philosophy among the Romans. It literally means the peace of Rome. The peace of Rome. The entire idea of Rome was that they would create the first peaceful society. Now, tonight we're going to Rome. Now, I love Rome. In fact, when we were coming back from Israel, when we got evacuated, we left out of Jordan, and we had our layover in Rome, and my wife and I, we like Rome so much, so we got to leave. You know, we cross the Atlantic, and we're going to go over there to Europe, and there in Europe, you, you come down to that uh, boot-looking uh, country, uh, Italy, and, and near the middle of there is Rome. Now, just in this area, Rome is just an incredible city. It's got a lot of history. It is estimated that its peak population in the first and second century it was ranged between 450,000 and 3.5 million. Now, most historians believe that there is between 1 and 2 million people. Here you can see the Colosseum. Over to the left, you can see the Circus Maximus. But here's the Colosseum. Now, the Colosseum wasn't originally called the Colosseum. Uh, it was named the Colosseum because there was a colossal statue of Nero that was built uh, some centuries later, but there are seven hills in Rome. One of them is known as the Palatine Hill. We're moving in that direction. Right there, our pan right now is the Roman Forum right there. And we're, don't worry, I'll show you some pictures. We're going to come back to this. But this is the Palatine Hill. At the base of the Palatine Hill, there's an, old, there's an old jail there. And you can go there today. It's known as the Mamertine Prison. Now, the Mamertine Prison is where Peter and Paul were in prison. In the first century, you can go to there to this day. There's a little memorial site down there. Uh, very, uh, just incredible architecture. Incredible architecture. Now, you know, another reason I like Rome is because they've got good gelato. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And they have vegan gelato. Uh, I'm a lacto. I, I, can't, I can't eat uh, dairy. I'm, I'm allergic. So uh, anyway, um, oh, I guess I, I moved. I, I, I talk too much. So here's a picture of my wife, um, and this was, we, we had a weird honeymoon. We were supposed to go to Hawaii, but uh, one of her friends ended up getting married, and so we went to Europe instead, and this was uh, our last night there in Rome. I wanted to make sure we had a good picture near the Colosseum. Now, let me tell you a little secret. This, this bridge that we're on, if you take that road and you're going to the right side, that's where the vegan gelato place is. You go about three, four blocks, all right? This is very important information. You got it. I don't see anyone taking notes. I don't know what's wrong with you people. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to see it on YouTube. But anyway, uh, you, you can go down there, really good vegan gelato. It's my favorite gelato place in the world. And I, I, I like making sure I eat the best. And so there's, there's a pretty decent pizza place down the corner as well. That's only about two blocks. Um, a lot of good, good hotels in Rome, but Rome is just an incredible city. So this is the Colosseum. To the right of that is the Roman Forum. This is an image of the Roman Forum. And, and one of the questions I really want to ask, when you, when you look at all the architecture there and you, you look at the society that Rome had, I mean, just an incredible society, it makes you wonder what caused Rome to fall apart. Remember that first night we were talking about Rome was not overtaken by another empire. It literally fell apart. Uh, it, it broke up. And so what caused the Roman society to break up? Here you can see, just, this is looking over the Roman Forum. This is on top of the Palatine Hill, looking down into the Roman Forum. There are multiple temples that were located in this forum. Um, obviously, they're ruins at this point, but the, you had the Temple of Saturn. You had the Temple of Caesar. You had just numerous temples. Romulus, remember Romulus, the two brothers? They, they're the ones who they say Rome is built after. Uh, that's where we get the word Rome, and then Vesta, the Temple of Vesta. Here's another image looking down the Roman Forum. At the very back of this would be the, so to the left is where the Mamertine Prison is. To the very back of this is where the Colosseum would be. It's, you can't see it from this angle because, uh, well, I mean, you go down and then you have to come back up. 
But this is very interesting. When we think of Rome, this well-structured society, this, this society that was militaristically powerful, I mean, one, you know, one historian described it as the iron monarchy of Rome. It was a strong society. It was one of the largest empires that has ever existed. In fact, uh, the only ones that probably rival it are those in Asia. You know, we think of China for particular. But very, very large city. In fact, when Augustus Caesar wrote about Rome, he said this, I found Rome a city of bricks, and I left Rome a city of marble. I mean, when he built Rome, he built Rome. He made Rome beautiful. Marvel was everywhere. Gods were everywhere. Temples to gods were just everywhere. This is, this is another image. This is the Roman Senate that sat in Rome. And the Senate was very powerful. You know, they would take bribes. They, they, they practiced fraud. There was politicians who en- enriched themselves at the expense of the common people, something that we would never see today. <laughs> I didn't hear a single amen. <laughs> but Rome was a very powerful society. We, we know that the aqueducts were designed, uh, and really, we had aqueducts before the Romans, but very, very infrequent. But the Romans were the ones who really built an aqueduct system. The Romans were also very well known for the Roman roads. You know, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, you know the story. The Romans were very much into the game. Horse racing did not start in America. (laughs) It dates back at least to the Romans. This is the Circus Maximus. You can see how large this is. It's just an incredible field. They would race around and around and and, and just, you know, just an incredible. They were a sports-thrilled society. They were a society that practiced fraud. They were a society that was falling apart because of something that was taking on Within, Later on, not in the first century, but a few centuries later, they built the Colosseum. We talked about it earlier. This is very hard to see from this image uh, just because we're way back here. But way at the other end, uh, there's actually a cross there for all the martyrs that died in Rome. Our our Catholic friends built a cross there, and they placed it there. It's still there to this day. The Colosseum, it stood originally, um, how do I say this? The, the Colossal of Nero, which stood right near there, that's why it's called the Colosseum, was 120 feet high. What's the tallest building in, in Kenya? Not, not, not 120 feet? No? Okay. See, they say 10 feet is about, uh, uh, 10 feet, 12 feet is about uh, one story. So any 10, 12 story buildings in Kingman? No? Okay. So you could see this thing from anywhere in Kingman. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Colosseum is just an incredible thing. It was built in AD, uh, well, it was, it was designed earlier in 69 AD, and it wasn't finished until about 80 AD. Uh, Vespasian and all these people, they, Titus is the one who opened up the games for the very first time in the Roman Colosseum, and it was capable of seating 80,000 spectators. That's just the spectators, not those who are involved in the actual Colosseum. The, the Colosseum is so well structured that they actually rebuilt it. I mean, they didn't rebuild it, but they built it in a way that they could house enough water to show a water battle scene of two ships battling against each other. This is live stuff. You know, today we make movies like Gladiator. There, they actually had gladiators, right? This was real stuff. It was, they were used to gladiatorial contests and other warlike games. They were a bloodthirsty society. It was a bloody sport, gladiatorial games. They were a bloodthirsty society. It has been estimated that at least 500,000 people and, a, and over 1 million animals died in the Colosseum game. Just incredible. Just incredible. So we, I ask the question again, when we, when we look at the magnificence of Rome and, and what Rome offered to the world, how is it that this incredible empire, this incredible society could fall apart? It's very interesting. One, one historian, probably well-known historian, you might have heard his name, H.G. Wells said this, the outline of History, Volume 1, page 490, Rome was content to feast, exact, grow rich, 
and watch its gladiatorial games without the slightest attempt to learn anything of the lands which they had raped. You know, sometimes they would feast for months. They would feast for months. And in fact, they, they had specially designed rooms that if they ate so much, they would go into these rooms, they would have these little bowls, and they would have these feathers that they would place in their mouths, and they called these rooms the vo- uh, vomitarium. They would literally vomit their food so they could eat some more. They were spending money for that which would enrich themselves. Yeah, this is PG. Okay, <laughs> I didn't say any children. So, now, Edward Gibbon, the very famous historian, said this in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, probably the most thorough work on how Rome fell, volume 3, page 215, but the most likely and splendid amusement of the idle multitude depended on the frequent exhibition of public games and spectacles. So their entire hope, they, they, the, the society was surrounded around public games. Very interesting. He goes on. He says, the impatient crowd rushed at the dawn of day to secure their places. And the happiness of Rome appeared to hang on the event of a race. So if their favorite racer lost, the whole society was just downtrodden. And if he won, yes, great. Do we see that in our society at all? Don't, 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 don't answer me out loud. <laughs> You know, I wonder, does this happen in our society? People getting sad when their favorite team loses. People having days of feasting and overeating. We're not in the holiday season right now, so I can say this. Shopping and getting the latest fashions. Romans were also very famous for their baths. Their baths, which not only housed bathing places, but this was a place where prostitution and homosexuality abounded like crazy. It was a vile place. In fact, their military was also very strong. The Romans were very well known for their military. They had an overextended military that extended everywhere around the then known world. And we mentioned this earlier, but all roads led to Rome. This was great for the gospel, but it also meant that Romans were everywhere. Romans were everywhere. So the Pax Romana. The entire idea of creating a society of peace, and yet there was no peace. How can we have peace in our own lives? How can we be in a society? Is our society anywhere similar to that of Rome? It's very interesting. There was a book that was published years ago. This guy, Walter Goffat, Rome's Fall and After, page 111, said this. The volume of the Cambridge Ancient History For the years, A.D. 70, so we're talking about ancient Rome. This is the period we're looking at, to 192, is called the imperial peace. But peace is not what one finds in its pages. You didn't find peace there. You found gladiatorial games. You had people dying and overeating and, and lusting and all these things. There was just no peace. Don't miss tomorrow night, by the way. Very interesting. So let's just, let's just recap here. Rome, uh, when Rome fell, it was filled with luxury and wealth. It was a pleasure-mad, amusement-centered culture. It, immersed, it was immersed in sports and entertainment. It was an immoral, sex-centered society. It was a violent and brutal society. It had an overextended military, and an over, it was overextended financially. They were trying to take care of the entire world. And yet they couldn't take care of home. Uh Uh-oh. I'll just let, I'll just, I'll just read, I'll just read this one right here. This is very interesting. David Walker, he was controller general of the U.S., a nonpartisan position in charge of the government. He said, he warned that there are striking similarities between America's current situation and the factors that brought down Rome. Have we, do we see that? We see that? We're only 14 minutes in. Including declining moral values, an overextended military in foreign lands, and fiscal irresponsibility by the central government. My friends, the reality is that something is fundamentally wrong with our society. And we know it. We can't act like we don't know it. 
We know it. Moral standards, which were once the rock bottom of our society, have just dissipated. It's almost as if, you know, it's your moral, it's my moral, and something in between might work out. <laughs> That's what we hope for. Ambassador General, um, Ambassador, excuse me, Henry Grunwald, managing editor of Time magazine. You might have heard of that magazine. He said this, For freedom to be workable as a political system, there has to be strong inner controls. There has to be a powerful moral compass and sense of values. And sense of values. My friends, if we lose the moral compass in our society, we're going to turn out just like Rome. In fact, at the rate we're going, we're turning out just like Rome. Turning out just like Rome. I mean, think about it. All you have to do is turn on the TV. Breaking news! Right? That's all you got to do. And you know what's happened in our society is we have become so used to, hey, this is the latest news, and that's the latest news. I'm even, I'm even getting sound effects. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> Sorry, I got to tease. But it's, it, it's just incredible. We hear breaking news all the time, and you know what's happened to us? We become numb. We become numb. We're so used to hearing the breaking news that breaking news doesn't even break us anymore. We hear of children being abducted. We hear of shootings happening in schools. We hear of all kinds of things happening around the world and it just doesn't fade us anymore. In fact, just a few years ago, actually this is several years ago, our society has become so violent that Time Magazine had a cover article saying, America the Violent. It's, be, it's just, it's, it's the norm of our society. I mean, I said this the other night, how many, well, maybe I didn't ask you the question, how many of you locked your doors? Yeah. Yeah. Why? I mean, you, you, no one, no one, you, you, yeah, yeah. We don't live in a society where you can leave your door open anymore. I remember, actually, I had a car, it was so bad. I shouldn't tell you the story, but I had a car, it was so bad. Uh, when it died, it had 352,000 miles. I mean, <laughs> the Lord was with me. They said angels used to push my car. That's what my mechanic said. But uh, it was very interesting. I, I left my car open all the time because I would say, Lord, if you just have somebody take it. <laughs> you, know, you and I, we can get a new car together. <laughs> Nobody ever seemed to want it. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with anyone. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I left it as open as I could. <laughs> but uh, anyway, anyway. You know, the reality is that research reveals that the reality of biblical truth is this. There's a, there's a biblical principle that says this. By beholding, we become changed. What we see, what we see, we are destined to become. What we observe, we are destined to become. In fact, Hosea 8 verse 7 says this. They have sowed the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. We have sowed the winds of immorality in our society and we are reaping the destructions of immorality in our society. We sow it by allowing our children to watch violence at young age, and then we wonder why in the world are our, our children so violent as they grow up? We've reaped a whirlwind. In fact, Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our hearts are so messed up, and, and so we might say, hey, look, just follow your heart. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just follow your heart. Every society has tried to create peace, and the way that they've done this is to try to, to eliminate an, uh, their own law system to create a government, or to create their own law systems and create a governance of stability. And yet, they're not able to do this. You know, even in our own society, think about it. Just some time ago, I, a friend of mine wanted to tour some place, and so I took him to this place. You know what this is? This is the Titan Missile Museum, just south of Tucson, Arizona. And in, in, in an effort to preserve society during the Cold War, we had, this, we had this system in place. It was a mutually agreed upon, you know, because anyone could destroy anyone. 
You got enough nuclear weapons? Hey, just send a few of those, and bam, you wipe out that entire place, and you're good. Uh, not so good. <laughs> not so good. And so we had this, we, and, 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 you know, it seems like we still got some things going on. I don't have to tell you about some place north of South Korea. <laughs> but very interesting. In fact, ancient laws, this is one of the most ancient laws that we have. This is the earliest known code of laws. It's the Ur-Namu code from the reign of Shugal of Sumer. This dates back at about four to 5,000 years. One of the oldest law documents that we have found. Every society has tried to create laws. In fact, my wife and I, we were in Paris sometime. This is the Louvre, Les Louvre en, France, uh, en, en Paris. In Paris, and if you go to the Louvre, you, you enter there. By the way, you know, uh, if, if you go to the right, that's where uh, the Mona Lisa is, but you're, you're not interested in that. So what you do is you go down, okay? You go down to the very bottom. This is the main entrance right there, that little pyramid structure. You go down, you go very end back. That's all the Egyptian stuff. I'm trying to give you the easiest route. And then you turn left, and then you take another left, um, and it will come back this way. This is just the easiest directions. And when you get there, you will see a huge, huge um, statue there or, or, or ballast there. And it is known as the Code of Hammurabi. The Code of Hammurabi was the code by which Abraham would have followed. Uh, in fact, a lot of the uh, things that Abraham did, it was based on those kind of codes back then. It's an eight-foot stele, an eight-foot stele. This dates back to Babylon. We talked about Babylon, one of the most ancient empires. goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel and these kind of things. But very interesting, um, every society has tried to create a code or law system by which to govern that society so that society could function in peace. Could you, could you imagine a society without any laws? Yeah? How, how do you drive on the roads? Sometimes I wonder how people drive on the roads. I'm not looking at anyone. I'm looking at the doors. I'm not trying to. I don't know you. I don't know you well enough to, to classify you as guilty or innocent or whatever. But very interesting. What, what if we had a society where we had no laws? What, what would govern us? What would govern us? Very interesting. Genesis 26 verse 5, speaking about Abraham, he said this. God said this about Abraham. Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, speaking of God, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. In fact, you remember the story of Abraham. It was Abraham who was called to take his son and get, get thee now thy son, thine only son whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah unto a mount of which I will tell thee of. You remember reading that story? In Genesis, and, he, and so he, he brings his son there. His son, might, by the way, this isn't a, a good depiction of how big his son would have been. He would have been around 20 years old. But would have taken his son there, and he was so faithful to God. Abraham kept God's commandments. And because of that, we now know Abraham to be a father of faith, right? A father of faith. Psalm 119, verse 165 says this. Great, what, what, what is that? Is that? Great peace. So here's how we can get peace, my friends. Ready for this? This is how we can get peace. Forget the Pax Romana. Think about the Pax of God. <laughs> the peace of God, man. Great peace have those, have those who love your law. And nothing causes them to stumble. Nothing causes them to stumble. So who are they? The they are those who love your law. Now, this is an incredible thing. You know, we live in a society that says, oh, we hate the law, and da-da-da-da-da, and blah-blah-blah-blah-blah. But the reality is that the Ten Commandments, God's, God's laws, actually speak relevance to us. I mean, if every society had a law system, Babylon, if every society had a law system, Rome, if every society had these law systems in order to keep the peace of the people, don't you think that God would have a law system to keep the peace of his people? I think so. And so these laws actually speak with relevance and meaning to us living in the 21st century. In fact, it was, it was Jesus who said this. 
And because lawlessness will abound, the what of many will grow cold? The love of many. The love of many. Don't we see that in society? Do we see a society that is just growing cold? Just growing cold. Looking toward earth's last days. Remember, this is Matthew 24. We talked about Matthew 24 just a few days ago. Looking to earth's last days, Jesus gives this warning. And Paul says that in the last days, perilous times would come. Men would be lovers of their own selves and, uh, you know, covetous and, and all these things. And it, it just goes down the list of those who are breaking God's law. Disobedient to parents. It's right there. Incredible. So is there a last day message that speaks with relevance to us? And we, we introduced this idea just the other night. We introduced this, that there is a, a message that goes out to the entire world. It envelops the entire world. It goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So regardless of where you are or who you are or whatever, your socioeconomic background, doesn't matter. God is speaking this message to each one of us. And this is the message. He says this. Here is the patience of the saints. So remember, this worldwide message, it starts in Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. That's what we talked about last night. We just talked about that last night. Now, at the end of that message, God is speaking about his unique, special people, those who fear and love him, those who follow God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, those who love Jesus. Speaking about that, that, that group of people, this is what it says about them. It says this, here are the patients of who? The saints. Now, I welcome some saints this evening. I, I heard there were no sinners here. I felt like I was the only one. <laughs> I'm just teasing. But here are those who, notice this, it's describing the saints. It's describing the saints. It's describing the saints at the end of time. And it says this, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the Bible describes that there is a last day group of people. And they, they seem to follow that same lineage of Abraham who kept the commandments of God, who kept his statutes and his charge and his commandments and his laws. It, it's that same group of people who followed God whithersoever he leads. It's, it's that group of people, and God is speaking to us, to them, to these last day people. Will you keep me my commandments? Will you keep my commandments? In fact, uh, let's, let's go back. Let's, let's see what God says. Now, some people say, you know, God didn't give them the Ten Commandments until Exodus chapter 20. But here's, a, here's, here's an interesting issue we got. How can he say that Abraham kept his commandments when the commandments weren't given in Exodus, until Exodus chapter 20? And Abraham existed in Genesis. So that's a question I got. In fact, uh, Joseph even says, how can I do this great sin against God? How could Joseph know what sin was? And we'll, we'll come back to this. But in Exodus chapter 16, not Exodus 20, in Exodus 16, as they were leaving Egypt, God says this, And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? And it's because they refused to keep God's laws that God had to reiterate the law to them. Are we living in a society where God is having to reiterate the law to us? Could it be that our society has lost the moral bedrock of what made our society so wonderful and great? Could it be that we are living in a time where people just don't care? They're not interested in, in God's laws. They're not interested in being faithful to God. And this is what's incredible. God literally wrote this with his own finger. And let me tell you something. If you don't already know this, and you probably do, so you know, just bear with me. You know how many times God wrote something down? Very few. Wrote it down, Exodus 20. Wrote it down again. Remember, Moses had to get the tablets, but God wrote it down again. Very clear. It says that twice in the Bible, in fact. And then, uh, you remember that incident in Daniel? Writing on the wall? Yeah, that's not a good situation. And do you remember Jesus, woman caught in adultery? Yeah, Jesus wrote something, right? Or on the sand. Now, sand, that can be blown away. You know, we live in Arizona. We know what we're talking about on this one. It can be blown away. <laughs> in, in, in Kingman, it can really be blown away, I tell you. <laughs> Yesterday was the least windy day I've experienced. But, but it's, <laughs> wait till tomorrow. But, but here's what's interesting. It's very hard to blow away 
what's in rock. Yeah. God wrote this with his own finger. My friends, his law is still relevant to our generation. It's still relevant to our society. And so let's just, let's just go through this very quickly. Let's just go through this. The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. In a society that worships things and money, that worships other gods and, and whatever, regardless of what we might think it is, anything that seems to consume our mind and our heart more than that of God. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. In a society that we make images of our cars and we worship them, our houses and have become our graven images, God says, the second commandment, you shall, make of yourself, you shall not make of yourselves a carved image. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. God knew that images and idols could lower our conception of who God is. God is much greater than all these images. Remember the prayer of Hezekiah? They are but stone. They are but carved images. You are the God of hosts. You are the God of hosts. It tries to reduce the creator to that which is created. We cannot do that. In a society where the name of Jesus Christ is dragged in the dust and used as a curse word, it still speaks with relevance. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. In a stress-filled society where men and women work for things of their hands and they have forgotten the creator of the universe, there is still a command that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In a society where children have no regard for their parents, there is still a commandment that says, honor thy father and thy mother. God wants to protect the family and society. In a society where, which glorifies killing and violence on television, there's still a command that says, thou shalt not murder. Yeah. In a society that glorifies sexual promiscuity, there is still a command that says, you shall not commit adultery. In a society where a person's goods are often not respected, the Eighth Commandment still speaks with relevance, you shall not steal. I guess it must have been plastered all over my car. In a society, <laughs> in a society that doesn't seem to care what anyone says, there's still a commandment that speaks with relevance. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Honesty and integrity, my friends, are important. They are very important. In a society uh, where the Tenth Commandment is often forgotten, still speaks with relevance. You shall not covet. My friends, God's law is the foundation of his throne. Just as yesterday we were talking about the sanctuary structure and in, the, in that most holy place where God's presence dwells 24-7, 365.25 days of the year, right there, housed in that mercy seat, is the law of God. It's right there. It's the bedrock of God's society. God's law is the eternal moral standard which defines sins and establishes our accountability toward God. We can't know what sin is if we don't know what the law is. The, the call today is a call back to God's word, a call back to God's law. It's a call back to obedience. It's God's law. His eternal moral standard is a, is a call that tells us to understand what sin is. In fact, it's, it's 1 John 3, verse 4 that says this, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness because sin is what? It's lawlessness. Now, you know what lawlessness is. It's, it's basically without the law. So if we don't have the law, we don't even have sin. So we've, we, that's why we live in a sin-filled society. Because we don't have a law that seems to govern us. A person may say, but, but, you know, that's what you think, pastor, preacher. You're paid to say things like that. No, I ain't. It's not what I'm paid for. It's about what God says, my friend. It's about what God says. He says that we live in a society where the violation of God's eternal law is breaking us apart. Sin is breaking God's law, simply. And God has given us His law to protect our freedoms. Think about it. Think about it. Just go with me to back to the Garden of Eden. Okay, I'm going off script here. Go to the, go to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam is there, Eve is there, and it's perfect and it's beautiful. I mean, 
honestly, it's very hard for me to imagine. Very hard for me to imagine. Let's just, just be real. But it was perfect, and, and, and God would actually come down, and he would spend time physically there with them, with them. In the cool of the day, God would appear. He'd be right there. And he'd talk to them, his friend, his friend. And, and you know what God told Adam and Eve? Hey, hey, all these trees, thou mayest freely eat of, but, but that tree right there, hey, don't, don't eat that tree. I don't know what's happening. But don't eat that tree. Don't eat that tree. That's, that's a bad tree. If you eat of that tree, I can't help you. And so God says this. All these other trees, you can have of those trees. But this one, no, no. What was God trying to do? He was trying to protect Adam and Eve from going into sin. And if they went into sin, we know the rest is history. We're living in it. We're living in it. God was trying to protect Adam and Eve. He wanted to protect them from experiencing the pain of sin, the suffering that all of us experience. And that's what God wants to do. In fact, if we keep God's law, we truly experience real freedom. You see, here's what we have done with God's law. We say, oh, man, it's burdensome and it's difficult and it's hard and I can't keep it. And let me tell you, you can't keep it. Your own strength, you can't do it. That's why we have to have the Holy Spirit. I tell you. That's, that's what we need. But here's what's incredible. If, if we have God dwelling in the life, in our heart, and we have the Holy Spirit there, man, we have power. And that gives us true freedom. We live in a society where we're like, oh, man, we can't do this and we can't do that. When God is like, man, I gave you all of this. And I've restricted you from this. Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you real freedom. You see, God's law is the pathway to true freedom. God's law does not limit our freedom. It enables us to truly be free. You ever been shackled by sin? Yeah, I have. Yeah. But God's law can give you freedom, man. It can give you freedom. In fact, James 2 verse 12 says this, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of what? Liberty. Give me liberty. Huh? <laughs> Give me liberty, my friends. The highest sense of freedom, the greatest sense of joy comes as we open our hearts and we know that we are living in harmony with God. There is nothing that feels so guilty than the soul that knows that it has sinned against the Son of God. The soul that knows that our sin is what caused the death of Christ on the cross. There's no greater guilt, my friends. Love always leads to obedience. And that's why Jesus said, Jesus' his own words, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. It will be natural for us to want to obey and follow God. I tell you, man, when I think of my wife, I don't think about other women. They just don't come into my mind. I'm single to my wife. And she's single to me. That's right. Ah, uh, you men, you got nothing on me. <laughs> no, but the truth is, you know, it's just, there's nothing that compares. There's nothing that comes in between that. And that's what our relationship with God is like. Dare I say, should be like. <laughs> the more that we love, the more we want to obey God. And the more that I grow in love with my wife, the more I want to be able to do more for her. The law is not some legalistic requirement. I obey God not because in order I want to be saved, not in order to be saved. We, the law cannot save us. Too many people got this wrong. The law cannot save you. We are saved by grace, through faith, in Christ. Not the law of God. It can't save us. It's very clear. But because I am already saved, I want to keep the law. That's what I want to do. Because I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love my God. A saved person, there's nothing, my friends, that could save us but Jesus Christ. The law can't do it. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4 says this, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, they're in love with Jesus, and does not keep his commandments is a what? A liar, and the truth is not in him. Oh, mercy. So what's the evidence of my genuine faith that I truly love God? that I'm going to keep his commandments. 
I'm going to keep his commandments. You know, we live in a society, for some odd reason, ever since Marcion back years ago said that there's a difference between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. And so we have a, we have a group of people these days that says, well, you know what? I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm a New Testament Christian. Then we got these other group of people say, that, well, I'm, a, I'm an Old Testament Christian. And so they say, well, no, 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 I don't follow the God of the Old Testament because the Old Testament God was a God of law. And he was, he was, he was you know, those people, they were saved by the law, but I am saved by grace. Let me ask you a question. Was Abraham saved by the law? No. Was Moses saved by the law? No. You remember what it actually says in Titus? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Notice that, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All men, Adam, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, all men, David, all these Old Testament men, Daniel, women too. Don't leave them out. No women said amen. I don't know. I don't know. I really, really tough crowd, I tell you. I tell you. <laughs> I struggle here. I struggle. You make me sweat. We're all saved by grace, my friends. From Genesis to Revelation, we're all saved by grace. All of us. That's the only way that we can experience salvation. You see, Adam looked forward to the cross. He looked forward to the day when the Lamb of God would come and take away the sins of the world. He looked forward to that day when, when Christ would take our sin upon himself and he would die. He would be beaten and, 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 and spit upon. Shame for us. That's what Adam looked forward to. And we look back to that. We look back to that. We can't be saved without Jesus, I tell you. We can't. It's not possible. Just not possible. We look back to Jesus, my friends. In fact, it's this, it's Romans 3, verse 20 that says this, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So I come to know what sin is by the law. In fact, I, if I don't know the law, I'm not going to know what sin is. Just not going to know it. Just not going to know it. Romans 4, verse 15 says, For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Transgression is breaking the law of God. And so this is what the law is like. It's like a mirror. It's like the mirror. Let's say I'm working in my garden, and I'm, I'm dirty, and I'm... I'm, 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 I come out of the garden, you know, I, I, I touch my face and whatever because, I, you know, I get itchy or whatever. Ridiculous flies that might, you know, whatever. So I get my face dirty and I, I go, I go my, my wife says it's time for dinner, some of the best words I ever hear. And so I just get ready and I, I say I got to wash my hands because that's kind of nasty. You know, you've been working in the garden. You don't need to be eating, you know, that, it's just not cool. And so you wash your hands and, and, and you get ready for dinner and, and your wife is, my wife says, hey, you're not that clean. Yes, I am. I'm looking at my hands. They're clean. I'm ready to eat. Let's eat. You know, I, we're Filipino, so we eat with our hands. And so, <laughs> well, she's Korean. She eats with chopsticks. But we meet in between, and so we use forks <laughs> and spoons. But anyway, she, um, she's like, no, 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 you're dirty. You're dirty. No, no, I'm not. Go and look in the mirror. And so I go to the mirror, and I'm like, you ridiculous mirror. You make me look dirty. And so I take the mirror off the wall, and I stomp on the mirror. Is that what I do? No, because the mirror helps me see what makes me dirty. Just like the law of God. The law of God is like a mirror that reveals to me who I really am and who I really am not. The law reveals that I'm fallen. It reveals my state, but the law cannot cleanse me. The law cannot create in me a clean heart. It's only God that says that can do that. That's why it says in Romans 7, verse 7, I would not have known sin except through the law. I would not have known sin except through the law. In fact, let's, let's just go through this really quick. If there is no law, my friends, then there is no sin because we wouldn't know what sin is without the law. And if there is no law, if there is no law, there is no sin. If there is no sin, my friends, then there's no grace because how can we be saved by grace if we don't know what the law or what sin is? We, we don't have any need for grace unless we know what sin is and, and have experienced sin. So if there is no law, if there is no, then there is no sin. If there is no sin, then there is no grace. And if there is no grace, then, my friends, there's no need for the cross. There's no need for the cross. 
Then why, why would Jesus have died on the cross if, if he didn't need to give us grace? And if there is no grace, there is no cross. And if there is no cross, my friends, then there is no salvation. Because why in the world would God need to give us salvation if he didn't have to send his son to die on the cross who had to give us grace in order to overcome our sin? Because there was a law. We had no need for a law. And so if there is no law, then there is no sin. And if there is no sin, then there is no need for grace. And if there is no need for grace, then there is no need for a cross. And if there is no need for a cross, there is no need for salvation. If there is no need for salvation, then there is no need for a Savior. Why then do we need the law? Because the law reveals sin, which drives us to receive His grace, which drives us to the cross, to receive salvation, and to accept Jesus as our Savior. That's why we need the law, my friends. Because the law points us to Jesus, the only one who can save us. The law points us to Jesus. So what then is the role of grace? What's the role of grace? If, 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 we, if, we, if we're saved under grace, then because grace reveals my need. Grace reveals my need. The Bible says this, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, a.k.a. law-keeping, lest anyone should boast. Grace is God's mercy and love to save us. Grace is God's mercy. Grace is God's pardon. Grace is God's forgiveness. And grace is God's power. A lot of people leave this one out. It gives us power to overcome sin. We can't overcome sin in our own strength. We can't do it. We can't do it. But by the grace of God, men, only by the grace of God is there hope for us. And grace is God's love. So does the law do away with grace? Let's read what Paul says. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Let me try to explain this in a very quick illustration. I've got to do this quickly because I'm looking at the clock and it's looking back at me. Some years ago, I was traveling from Canada back down into the U.S. My wife's Canadian. I was visiting her. And uh, I was driving back down. And this is what the road looked like. It was just a clear road. Nobody was around. And so I was coming down this hill. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but for, sometimes when you're coming downhill, your, your foot just seems to go down at the same time. And it, 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 it's not always on the brake one, but it's on the accelerator one. And I was going down <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> But I went down, and all of a sudden, I saw these lights flashing. I, it's lights that I'm very unfamiliar with. And, 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 and these lights, they, they, they were coming from the other direction. In fact, so much so that he came back around and, and said he needed to meet me. <laughs> and so we met, and we had this little conversation, and I asked him, Oh, sir, <laughs> can you show me some mercy? Do you know the difference between grace and Grace, mercy, and justice. And mercy is getting something you don't deserve. <laughs> he said, I'm showing you mercy by not taking you in right now. <laughs> Wrote me up a ticket. Greatly deserved. You got to admit when you're guilty. Now, when he wrote me up that ticket, I got back in my car, and I boomed just as fast as I was there, didn't I? <laughs> no, you, you've never done that? No? I mean, the rocks were spinning, and it came up and hit his windshield. I was out of there. I was out. Of there. No, I don't think so. Man, I tell you, I was going 65 and 75, man. <laughs> Haven't gotten a ticket since. You know why? Because I was given grace. And grace told me, Malcolm, you don't live that way anymore. You don't live that way anymore. You're a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> law-abiding citizen. Jesus said this, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
He goes on to say, for assuredly I tell you, I say this to you. Guys, um, did you see that? You didn't just see that? I think we're still here. I think we're all still here. We're still here, right? Am I the only one here and I'm just hearing things? I'm just seeing things, figment of my imagination. Maybe I'm growing a little delirious. Jesus t- says, till heaven and earth pass away. I don't think heaven and earth have passed away yet. I don't know about you. I was just checking. I was just checking. You made me a little nervous there. Probably made you a little nervous. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one diddle will no, and tittle no, will no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. He didn't come to change the law. Jesus came to change our hearts. That's what he came to do. He, the Bible says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so Jesus, when he comes into our hearts, his law is, becomes something we want to do. And as we want to follow Jesus, my friends, when we accept Jesus into our heart, he brings his pardon. He brings his freedom. He brings his forgiveness. He brings his grace. And as he brings that into our lives, then we become law-abiding citizens of heaven. We then experience the peace of God. You know why? Because even if the whole world is messed up, we know we're right with God. We know we're right with him. And if we know that we're right with God, then it's going to be all right right here going to be okay right here. My friends, the entire law can be summarized in one word. Love. Summarized in one word, love. If you live in harmony with God's law, you want to love God, that covers the first four commandments. And you want to love your neighbor as yourself, that covers the last six commandments. In fact, it was Jesus who said this, on, on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. My friends, I don't know what you came here with tonight. Maybe you have just stuff inside. You're going through stuff. And you know you're not right with God. I mean, you read these commands and you're like, "Mm, I know I got another God in my life. I know something that's consuming my life or Maybe you, you, you just think about this and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm just, I don't have that peace with God. My friends, I want to introduce you to a very special place in my heart. And that's the cross of Christ. My friends, bring your burdens. Right here. Right now. Don't delay. Tell the Lord just right now, Lord, I want to bring my burdens and leave them here at the cross. Leave them right here at the cross. Whatever might be consuming you, whatever might be bringing you that lack of peace, my friends, when we come to Jesus, our burdens are lifted on Calvary, and we come away changed people. We become new in Jesus Christ. When we come to him, we find grace. That's why the Bible says this, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their heart. Why in our heart? So that we love it. So that we love it. And I will write them, I will put the law in in their minds so that they know it. I will write it in their hearts so they love it. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. You just want to say to Jesus today, Lord, I want to be your people. Maybe you're holding on to something. Maybe you're clinging to something. And you know that this something is, it, it, it's, it's sin. Let's just be real. It's sin. We're clinging to sin. We, we, we're clinging to something that, that is not in harmony with God's will. And we know it. And so we say, tonight, my friends, I, I, I want to encourage you. I want to 
implore you, surrender it to God. Surrender it to Jesus right here, right now. If you just want to give that commitment to Jesus, right here, Lord, I know I have something, but I want to surrender it to you. I want to surrender it to you. I don't know what you're struggling with, but God can read your heart. You can tell him right here, right now. Lord, I just want to surrender it to you. You want to pray that tonight? Let's pray. Father in heaven, for some reason, sin has come into our lives. And yet you love us. You have so much love for us. But Lord, we we want to be filled with your love. We want to be filled with your grace. So that way we can be in harmony with you. This is our desire, Lord. And so right now, right here, without any delay, without any distraction, we give you our hearts. We give you our minds. And we ask that you will write your law right here in our hearts. May we be in peace with you. For this we pray in Christ's name.